Okay, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, today, we're going to be learning how to survive eBPF deployment on Kubernetes with a new tool that we like to call BPFD. I am Andrew Stoikis. I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat, working in the office of the CTO. Um, I am a BPFD maintainer, and one of my other cool projects is also Network Policy API, which just got done with a talk on. So if you want to check out the recording, that'd be awesome. And I'm Shane Utt. I'm a staff software, it's a little louder, isn't it? <laughs> staff software engineer at Kong and uh, a chair of SIG network and a maintainer at Gateway API and contribute to BPFD, which kind of happened through the Gateway API project. So um, we're kind of thinking most people in this will be generally aware of eBPF, but if not, we'll do a high level. And then if you need to learn more, please do feel free to talk to us afterwards. Um, but basically, you can kind of think of it similar to something like a kernel module, where you can write code that you can load into the, uh, the kernel uh, using the VM that's provided with BPF. Um, so you can do things like networking, security, observability, and tracing by writing a little bit of code, loading it into the kernel, and it's a lot more lightweight than kernel modules used to be. Um, there's a bunch of different projects uh, that do this. Um, obviously, there's a ton of them at this point, um, and basically you have a variety of different ecosystems that have kind of built up and all of these different projects, and that's part of what we'll talk about today. Um, but more importantly, and more specific to the purpose of this conference, we're gonna talk about why eBPF and Kubernetes, um, and how, actually. So eBPF is, like we said, it's very good framework to extend and like go into kernel space and do things that you wanna do, like observability and networking, but it comes with some costs. Um, and there's many different uh, examples, all of which do kind of different things, like Celium is, and Calico are great examples of CNIs doing networking, Pixie is open source observability, KubeArmor does security, uh, Blix, which is actually a project that's kind of, Andrew and I work on that's kind of connected uh, to BPFD, um, is a L4 uh, load balancer that we started in the Gateway API project, and then there's NetObserve, which is network observability in OpenShift. There's lots more projects, and uh, we'll have some links to like the sites and stuff like that. Um, but there are issues with eBPF programs in Kubernetes. Um, it's difficult right now, and we'll talk about some of those difficulties. One of the big ones is security. Security is a big problem with eBPF today, and especially in a Kubernetes environment. Uh, one of the top problems there is that eBPF programs are not namespaced, so they can easily escape container isolation. They're not isolated. Um, and that rely and they rely on highly privileged containers. So people will like use highly privileged containers to load these programs and work with them. And they're also pretty vulnerable to supply chain attacks, which we'll be talking about more in upcoming slides. So digging in a little deeper, uh, eBPF not being namespaced. So like you have to be you, eBPF has to be loaded from rootful containers. So basically they're just in the root namespace. So. Um, even with basic permissions, we've seen evidence of like privilege escalations that were, you know, that have happened in the past. We had like this particular one, which you can go look at if you want to with unprivileged mode, which is now patched and that's gone, but there will be more in the future. Um, and since eBPF and containers are able to modify the host kernel, they're, it's just like I just said a couple of times, they're just not really contained. Uh, it's not a container in, in the way that you have to use the container to load these programs. Um, so. Some features are just not restricted to, so like some types of programs, and that's what we got going on in this diagram here, are just gonna be able to do a lot of things, like a lot of things that you might not want them to be able to do. So digging deeper into highly privileged containers, uh, you at least need cap BPF, um, which we generally you should just kind of look at that as I'm giving it root, more or less. In practice, there are several different capabilities that you can give it like uh, sysptrace, netadmin, sysadmin. Um, but in all cases, you, it's, it's, it's a lot of privileges. You can't really get very fine-grained uh, privileges to like get least privilege for your program, the thing that it needs. And it also has the problem of like you can't, it's not common at least for people to have like, I load up and I use the capabilities briefly when I need them and then I don't have them anymore. It's usually for the entire life cycle of the application, they have these high elevated privileges that they're, they're uh, running with. Um, so there's a lot of examples of how you can do scary things, scary things with eBPF. Um, our friend Alessandro over at the uh, Aya project built Snoop, which lets you snoop on, uh, or Snuffy, it lets you snoop on all SSL traffic. You can do things like 
redirect and basically like fish uh, SSH connections. You can deploy, uh, there's all kinds of key loggers. This is just one example. If you go on GitHub, you can find others. Um, you can also do things like just attach probes to things that are like performance sensitive and then lag the system. You know, that's no good. Um, and in particular, we're going to show you a demo of uh, using the trampoline pod threat to exploit a cluster. So security issues, yes. Uh, we also have functional issues. Um, so func some functional issues are like, a lot of programs operate in these silos, or at least they, they present themselves in a silo. So like with CNIs in particular, um, you have where a CNI will be doing a bunch of networking eBPF code, and it has no awareness if there's another one out there. So if you're running a CNI that does eBPF programs, and then you maybe write your own program, you might end up in a situation where it, you load that program and you don't really know which one's running first and you don't really know if you're like hijacking and like breaking traffic for your CNI. It can become hard to understand if you're having like interoperability problems and this can lead to instability. Um, the one that hurts me the most usually is just general visibility and debugability. Like at the cluster scope, especially when you have large clusters, trying to understand <laughs> all what's going on, like all these eBPF programs running in there is really hard to look at today. Um, and then there's also issues with like versioning, uh, fine-grained versioning, so like your user space and kernel space, so, like you have, some people do embedded bytecode, some people don't, like actually put the eBPF bytecode into their project and some people don't, so it's not always clear like what version of which is running necessarily. And with, if you have different kinds of eBPF programs, they all might be doing that differently. Um, and then kind of in the same vein as that, Almost every implementation does something different from almost every other implementation in terms of how they actually load and manage their eBPF programs. So it's not a great ecosystem for, uh, uh, it's not a great ecosystem when you have lots of different eBPF programs from different kinds of, you know, applications that are doing different things. So enter BPFD. This is where we started working on BPFD and uh, thinking about some of these problems. Um, so BPFD is an open source project which started out in the Red Hat Emerging uh, Technology Group, and it is a program manager that manages the lifecycle, loading, unloading, pinning of eBPF programs, and kind of removes CAT BPF from the equation. Um, it enables pro program cooperation, so you can do things like actually prioritize which networking application runs before the other and know which one is there and like visibly look into them. Uh, it provides a central process for managing loading policy for security and visibility. Um, BPFD is built in Rust, and it's built on top of the Rust library Aya. Um, it includes, and important to this particular crowd, a Kubernetes operator and APIs developed in Go with controller runtime. So we like literally have an eBPF program API, which we'll show you in some of the upcoming slides. Andrew? Yeah, sweet. Thank you, Shane, for kind of setting the stage um, at a high level before I hop into some of the core features of BPFD. We are really focused on the eBPF in Kubernetes at a generic level use case. We're not really um, specifying a single type of app. We aren't uh, focused on just observability, just traffic shaping, um, or any other specific use case. We want it to be kind of a generic um, coming together of the community to try and figure out some of the problems and fix things. So some things BPFD provides today, uh, starting with productivity. We work to uh, avoid application uh, duplication in the loading and management stack by taking care of that for various applications. BPFD is now the central process that is going to be loading and managing your BPF programs um, if you want it to. We also have other use cases where BPFD doesn't have to sit in that load path. Um, but it seems kind of like a cool futuristic one that we've explored so far. A thing we do to help with that is we allow users to distribute eBPF programs via OCI container images. So this is not a completely novel concept. Other projects out here have done similar things. Um, many of you may be in, uh, familiar with even Inspector Gadget. They package their gadgets in OCI images, but it's a little more constrained to just their use case. Um, we tried to make this kind of ambiguous to use case. Like we just want to um, package eBPF bytecode in OCI container images. We've written a spec for that. We'd love to co uh, work with other groups who are also doing similar things. So security-wise, so nowadays, BPFD, if you're using it to load, is the only thing on your system that needs to run with CAT BPF. That reduces your um, wide attack surface and kind of helps leave 
uh, helps remove the proliferation of privileged naming sets that we see oftentimes in Kubernetes with BPF-enabled applications today. Um, with this and the Kubernetes integration, we also get the benefits of Kubernetes RBAC. Um, it doesn't really make sense yet, but you'll see later on in our uh, Kubernetes design slide, we have specific CRDs uh, that allow users to load programs. Those can be controlled by RBAC. And we have future plans to define even more policy around BPF. Lastly, we also have cosine integration that works in tandem with our OCI bytecode image spec because now we can basically sign BPF programs that are in images and verify the ownership of those programs. So this is something that the kernel's been working on for a long time. They haven't gotten it dialed in yet, so we said, let's try to figure it out in user space. So that's what we're doing for today. In turn of, terms of observability, this is kind of outside the load path and is something that we've been exploring even more lately. We've heard from users and, and other folks that being in the load path for a lot of applications isn't perfect. It's not perfect at all. So we've also been exploring other things, specifically around eBPF subsystem monitoring uh, at a cluster scope, because there isn't really much of that in Kubernetes today. Um, we do this in Kubernetes by reflecting some eBPF subsystem state back up through the Kubernetes API, and we're gonna see more of that later on in this demo. In terms of program support, we have native support today for XDP, TC, TracePoint, UProbe, KProbe, um, along with UREP probes and KREP probes. Um, so that's where we're at today. We have plans to add more programs, but that's kind of what we've been focusing on. Last but not least, we leverage the libxdp protocol to provide a multi-program cooperation for XDP and TC programs. Uh, there has been great work going on in the kernel um, to provide multi-program cooperation for TC programs, so one day we hope to be able to not have to maintain all of this our, by ourselves. Um, we wanna move to you know, using kernel native APIs if we can. So that's some of the core features. Um, and I just wanna reiterate what the world looks like today again and again. Um, so today we have multiple BPF-enabled applications, in this case Blix, NetObserve, CubeArmor. They're all using their own um, BPF management libraries to interact with the BPF kernel subsystem. For those of you who may be newer to BPF, you're basically loading and attaching programs via BPF syscalls and then your user space portion of your program is interacting with those BPF programs running in the kernel via BPF maps. Um, and everything here obviously requires cat BPF. And so already the use of BPF has exploded. So the number of these privileged Damians running on every node is gonna continue to explode. Um, and that is gonna, we think, one day turn into a nightmare for, for big distros and cluster admins far and wide, yeah. So this is an idea of the future with something like BPFD. Um, in this scenario, your BPF-enabled applications basically just write YAML. They create a specific dedicated program CRD, whether that's one of our supported programs, so XDP or TC, et cetera, that defines the intent for BPF um, across the cluster. Um, so then BPFD takes care of loading and attaching those programs and also sharing those maps with the uh, BPF-enabled applications. So then really the main kind of change for the applications is all they have to do instead of, of, of loading via one of the libraries is create a CRD and then use one of those same libraries to interact with their maps via pins uh, that we provide back to the applications. And how we do that is with CNI, I'm gonna go, or CSI, sorry. I'm gonna go into that a little bit further on the next slide. The last thing I really wanted to highlight here is now your BPF-enabled applications do not need cat BPF. We've kind of consolidated it into one privileged Damien, which is BPFD. Okay, so I'm not gonna go super deep into the architecture, but I'm pretty excited with it. I think it's kind of fun. Um, so if we start up on the, I guess for you all, it's the left side of the screen a user would create a explicit program, CRD, and we have a process written in Go called the BPFD agent that is basically our Kubernetes controller and it interacts with BPFD over a Unix socket, all pretty standard stuff. That's uh, telling BPFD to load a certain program from a certain bytecode image, um, et cetera, et cetera. 
what BPFD does is, is loads and attaches that program and then also manages its pinpoints in a really cool way. Um, we store those pinpoints on the node. But one of the big problems originally was we needed a way to share the BPF maps and pinned maps uh, with the eBPF enabled applications in a way that didn't require privileges. Um, it makes a lot of sense just to use a host path, right? But host path uh, volumes require privileged containers. So we decided to actually implement the CSI spec in order to share BPF um, maps and pinned maps with the applications. Uh, specifically, we use ephemeral inline volumes. As you can see in our pod YAML here, uh, we really liked the API of ephemeral inline volumes. It's super simple. An application can say they want to use the BPFD CSI driver. They can say what program they want maps from, and they can even specify the maps they want uh, from that program, and then simply mount it into their container for use via uh, a typical loading and management library. Um, and none of that requires the container to be privileged. So this is a pretty recent development on our side, and we're really excited about it. So that's kind of the overview of the architecture. Sweet. OK, so I'm going to hop into a demo. I'm going to move somewhat quick, because there's a lot to cover. If you want, this QR code takes you to a, a branch of BPFD where I've implemented the demo. You can kind of follow along if you'd like. OK. so. As we talked about before, um, most BPF applications today uh, are privileged. They maintain their own stack for loading and management. And that's exactly what we've done here. We've done an example application using an XDP program attached to the main network interface on the node. And all it's doing is counting packets. Okay? User space and BPF are compiled together like many of you are very familiar with today. Almost everyone does it like that. And that BPF program is just running on the node, counting packets, as we see here. OK, so let's think about what it would take to turn this typical BPF program evil. Um, for the purposes of this demo, I got really excited and implemented a service account token stealer. So what this service account token stealer does is uses BPF trace point programs to essentially easily break out of the pods container boundaries, the Go XTP counter pods container boundaries. It's going to sit there and listen for any process on the entire host to open a service account token. Um, it, it's not isolated to its container boundary. And then we can steal that token from kernel memory and write it out to standard out in our evil pod. This is kind of an exploitation of the trampoline pod threat, which some of you may be familiar with. It's um, basically where evil actors can access service accounts, which allow um, the evil actor to like degrade a whole cluster just from one single node. Um, yeah, cool. Sweet. So looking at this in a little more depth, if the binary containing the user space and EBPF programs is compromised via whether it's a supply chain attack, a privilege abu abuse, user spoofing, et cetera, exploitation is relatively simple. The application container is already privileged, so it can load other malicious BPF programs alongside its original program. In this case, we've loaded four trace points attached to um, sysenter uh, open at and sysenter and exit read, which allow us to do the uh, service account token stealing. Um, so now we'll hop into a little bit more look at that. Um, I'm giving you a, a look ahead. Um, I've implemented this. It's running on a kind cluster, which we'll show next. And we're able to, in our Go XDP counter pod, get information like this. So some scary information. We'll dive into it a little bit more here. And one of the really scary parts about all of this is that it can basically be invisible. For the sake of our demo, we're dumping stuff to standard out, so it's obvious something is going wrong, right? Like we have all this extra standard out in our Go XDP counter. But if you're just a cluster admin, your cluster isn't necessarily degraded. If you're more malicious than I was for this talk, you could just be opening a port and sending those tokens uh, over the network, or you could be writing them somewhere on disk. Um, there's a lot of malicious ways that this can happen. Great, so I'm gonna go ahead and start our demo here. Speed it up, because I'm a slow typer, and you all do not want to watch me type. So. <laughs> I'm going to start from the beginning. I'm creating a kind cluster on my local machine. 
Um, that kind cluster is pretty standard. It only has one node. It's not very exciting. That's not what we're focusing on. So that is up and running. Now we're going to apply our evil XDP counter application. And you have to watch me type. OK, so at first, it looks like everything's progressing normally, right? Packets are being counted. Uh, that number is going up. But if we watch a little further, oof. What is that? Oh, gosh, something bad's happened. We're dumping a lot of privileged information in this pod. The service account token is at the top. And this, a service account token, for those of you who don't know, is just a JSON web token. And we've actually parsed it down below. And it gives us a bunch of information that's a little bit scary. In this case, it's uh, relating to the KineNet pod. So we get Kubernetes contextual information, such as namespace, pod, UUID, et cetera. along with PID in this case, I decided to print out. Cool. So another thing I'm going to show is like, like for me, I'm a developer. If I thought something funky was going to go on, I would get into my node and try to run BPF tool, because that's how I learned to do BPF in day one. Um, but of course, BPF tool doesn't exist on most distros nodes uh, by default, so that's kind of tricky. So what we're going to do now is go back into our evil pod. We're going to see that core DNS has been excluded, and we're going to copy that token and save it for later. Great, so we're going into our XCP counter pod now. We're dumping the service account token for that pod, and then we're going to use it to try and list all the pods at a cluster scope. This is not going to work. As you can see, the service account go XP counter is forbidden to do that. But now we can copy and paste that core DNS token that we had scraped and saved earlier, do the same thing. Oh, shoot, it works. That's kind of crazy. We have essentially stolen core DNS's identity in this cluster. And just to verify that we've done that, I show here I do something we can't do with core DNS uh, system account, service account token. And it shows us, like, wow, we're in Go XTP counterpod, but Cube API thinks we're core DNS. Sweet. Yeah, and that was just like a really simple example with core DNS being impersonated. Imagine if you're one of those poor souls that has something running with cluster admin. So Yeah. So how does BPFD help? So first off, we're going to start by just installing BPFD and check out all of the BPF programs running on a given node. So in this scenario, BPFD isn't in the load path, but we can still use it to kind of help us out here. So installing is pretty easy. We start by just installing BPFD CRDs, and then we're going to install the operator, which takes care of deploying the daemon. We're going to make sure everything is up and running correctly. Yay, still coming up. We all love container creating. Things look good. OK, next thing we're going to do is dump all of the BPF programs, which we have a CRD for. Awesome. This only has one node, so it's pretty easy. We're going to check this out and go, Hmm, a lot of those are kind of erroneous systemd programs that are running on my Fedora node. Um, I also see on there my XDP stats program running at the way bottom, which is my example XDP counter application. And I see some other weird ones, right? Enter open at, enter read, exit open at, and exit read. I don't really know where those are from. So I'm going to drill down into those programs a little bit more here in a second. Love my spelling there. <laughs> OK, so now we actually check out that program. And you can see that we um, get a bunch of kernel-related information that you usually get with BPF tool. So things like its kernel ID, what time it was loaded at, map IDs it's using, et cetera, along with what type of program it is. And this was a program not loaded by BPFD. So we're working out of the load path, just providing observability. Now what I'm going to show next 
is, is the, finding the startup time of the Go XTP counter application and correlating that to the loaded at time of the BPF program, which helps us correlate what evil actor actually was in charge of that. Cool. And that's what I wanted to show there. So this just reiterates what I just showed in the demo, um, correlating your loaded at time to the pod started at time. Um, at the end of the day, this is still really early in BPFD. We'd love to clean this up so that it's a little more automatic, but this is how we do it for now. Okay, so we started about, we, we talked about discovery. We've, we're, we've installed BPFD, we've discovered something has gone wrong. How does BPFD actually provide some mitigation techniques? So first things first, we're gonna delete the evil application, then we're gonna redeploy with BPFD. So we're gonna write an XDP program YAML, um, but if you would notice, the bytecode image that we're using is still using that evil program, but it's not gonna matter, because we're, all, we're completely declarative in terms of our BPF behavior on the node. Another thing we're gonna notice now is our Go XDB counter user space program is not privileged, which is kind of the goal all along. And you can see the CSI volume amounts that I had kind of talked about a little bit earlier, the ephemeral inline volume amounts. So the reason I can still load um, that evil XDP piece of bytecode is because um, we are only gonna load the XP program from that bytecode. There may be other trace point programs in there as well, but because the Go XTP counter service account token does not have the ability to create trace point programs, they are not gonna get loaded and attached by BPFD. Additionally, we're gonna see some um, behavior of how we use cosine to verify whether these bytecode container images are signed or unsigned. And we're gonna see this again really quick in the demo. So first things first, we're gonna delete our, our evil XTP counter. And then this is one little step I'm gonna highlight here. We are having to enable the CSI support in BPFD. We're using 0.3.0, .0, which we just released recently. CSI is not enabled by default. It will be very soon. So that's one little in-between step I wanted to call out. As you can see now, BPFD has three containers running in its pod. One is implementing CSI. Next thing I'm gonna do is deploy the XDP counter program uh, application with BPFD. As you can see, that's working. It's up and counting packets again. We are going to look at the XDP program Kubernetes object. As you can see, um, it specifies things like our image bytecode, which is still evil. Um, we have a priority for that because we, we support XDP multi-pro cooperation. We have things like interface selector, which in this case you don't have to provide an interface in the elector. We can just specify primary node interface. Um, we also have proceed on, which defines how the behavior between ordered XDP programs happens. And obviously it's still pointing to an evil bytecode. We can also triple check that those evil trace points aren't there anymore. You can see our um, Go XTP counter example is there, but the evil trace points we saw before are no longer there in terms of the BPF programs on the node. Yay, that's a good thing. Sweet, the last thing I'm gonna show is that we can see some sign that something's wrong, that we're still using the evil piece of bytecode by looking at BPFD's logs. Specifically, we can see that that bytecode image is unsigned. Awesome. This is really rudimentary. In the near future, we're gonna have more policy around who we support in terms of deploying BPF onto your cluster, what actors. So the last thing I end up showing here, let's see, I'm still typing slow, is editing your XCP program and hot swapping the BPF bytecode to a container image that we now trust. Yay, go away with the evil. Obviously it's not this easy in real practice, but for purposes of a demo, I think it's great. And you can see that BPFD reports that the bytecode image is signed. Oops. 
see if I can get to the next slide. Okay, I'm gonna hand it back to Shane. Thank you, Andrew. So yeah, and that's what we've been working on and we'd love to have other people get involved. Um, we have, uh, if you wanna get started with the project itself, there's a bunch of different ways you can do that. BPFT can be loaded as a standard Linux uh, uh, daemon and you can use BPF cuddle, but also you can use the operator on any kind of Kubernetes cluster. You can do it on a kind cluster locally if you just wanna try it out real quick. Um, we provide examples in the repository, and we also have a website, bpfd.dev, which has examples, guides, and kind of can get you started if you're interested in just trying this out and seeing what this looks like. Um, we also work in, with it in SIG Network now. So um, Blixt, which is a layer four load balancer um, that we created in the Gateway API project, is actually using BPFD as its loader and manager for its TC ingress and TC egress programs. Um, it is uh, used mainly for CI and testing scenarios today, and we are the maintainers of that as well. Um, it may be, an, if you're not interested necessarily in like just doing basic uh, eBPF examples, but rather would like to see BPFD kind of in action in a, pro in a, in a uh, project that's actually using it right now, this could be a good place. You can use that QR code there to go check that out in Kubernetes SIGs. And then in general, we have a community we'd love to see you uh, join. Um, we have weekly community meetings for BPFD on Thursdays, and we have the BPFD channel on Kubernetes Slack, um, which actually, if you need the community meeting links, they're posted automatically in that Slack channel. We also have eBPF uh, for general eBPF discussion in Kubernetes. Um, so if you're like, there's also like Celium, uh, Celium Slack for BBPF and stuff like that, but there's quite a few people who are like focusing specifically on eBPF and Kubernetes hanging out in there. If you need some help, please don't feel free, or please feel free to go in there and ask for help. Um, we're also very active in the AYA and Rust communities, so that's actually on Discord rather than Slack, but you can find us in there as well. And there's links to AYA in the bottom left, which if you're interested specifically in, in writing eBPF stuff in Rust, and then uh, our community page to get like the, the channels and stuff like that. Um, so we, want, we have a bit of a roadmap. We actually literally have a GitHub project roadmap because we're trying to provide some transparency on like where, we're, where we think we're going with this. So if you wanna go take a look at that and see what we have so far, we'd also love to hear from you if there's things that you think we need to be thinking about on our roadmap. Uh, we currently plan to apply as a CNCF sandbox project. Um, we're in the midst right now, like literally during KubeCon, of going to a daemonless daemon -less design. Um, the community is deliberating it. Well, we're yeah, we're yeah, working it's, it's, on some design documents, but um, yeah, we're excited it's, it's, about it. It's an in-progress thing, so if you're interested, uh, please check that out. But in general, um, in this project, we're trying things out. We're experimenting. We're basically seeing these problems, identifying these problems that seem to be kind of very universal eBPF problems, and we're trying something to solve them. However, we're more interested in the high-level goals. We're more interested in solving these problems than we are in the exact way in which we solve them. We're not married to the solution that we have today necessarily. So joining the community is particularly important. If you're working in eBPF, we want to work with you to maybe change course significantly, just so that we're all doing it together, so that we're actually solving these security, functional, and like ergonomic problems with eBPF, because there are a lot of them today. Um, so that's kind of the bigger, highest level goal of this project. Thank you, and we have a couple minutes for questions, I think. Yeah, we're done. <laughs> Yeah, I think we have a minute. Yeah, we got a minute. Just wondering about cosine. Uh, I assume you have the cosine binary included in the in in the program in the daemon set. Nope, set? we're actually using the cosine Rust bindings. Oh, right, right. Yeah, right. yeah built yeah, into yeah. BPFD. Is, is it possible to um, uh, check against like a private SIG store stack rather, or or is it just the public good instance of SIG store? So to be completely honest, I am not the cosine expert in our community. Um, I'm sure it is. I do not have an answer for you today, though. All right, I'll so check So jump it into out. our Slack. I'm, uh, I'm sure I'll we have people who know. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, uh, excellent talk. It was Thank you. Really Thank great. you. Thank you.
Hey, uh, I just wanted to do a, do a quick plug on a couple of things. Um, so uh, in the IETF, we're actually standardizing a bunch of things around how people load BPF programs, BPF instructions set, a whole bunch of stuff like that. So everyone is welcome to join that. It's like IETF BPF working group. So you can Google it, you'll, you'll find it. Um, and related also in the Linux community, um, it kind of, there's a lot of ideas around how enforcement around RBAC. So I think like the RBAC thing was like super interesting in terms of how uh, you know, you can say these BPF programs can load, you know, these trace point yeah. hooks or that sort of thing. So um, I think that's like a super active area of discussion also um, awesome. there. So like we should definitely uh, collaborate. So yeah. 100%. Yeah, thank you. And we would really appreciate it if you would come join us and, uh, and like check yeah. in with us because we want to work with you on these cool. things. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. Thanks so much.